If you say that is an amazing tie he is wearing, I would say I agree. <laughs> this was my yard sale find. Which I should say my daughter, Madeline, bought this for me and surprised me last night. She saw me eyeing it, and I looked for every blue shirt I have, and I have several of them. I don't have that. I'm a 17 and a half, 36, 37. If you want to find a Robin's Egg Blue, I'll wear it in your name. It, it, I think this might be John Rudy's tie, which if that's the case, it makes it even more special, more specialer. He was a dear friend. Boy, I miss that brother. A couple times this week, I was just like, man, this chap, my old buddy, right, Kurt? Yeah. So anyway, if you're saying that's a dapper tie, I agree. I agree. I agree. It cost me a lot. <laughs> Full day in the sun. Okay, enough. Let's pray. Father, this passage brings us to our knees at your goodness. There are so many times we don't deserve it to get bailed out. I could understand if we do right, we stumble into trouble, we cry out to you, it would make sense. But Father, when we've done foolishly and still there in the pit, you come and you rescue. And we know that we don't deserve it. You're a good God. This passage brags on your goodness. Help us to remember Psalm 34 when we've gotten ourselves into a pile of trouble, that your ears are open to, the hear, to, the, to those who fear your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to begin in Psalm 22. Or not Psalm 22. 1 Samuel 22. This is one of the few psalms in the selections that I've made of the psalms that I'll be preaching this year that actually tells you what's the background for what's written. So that's incredibly helpful as a preacher. The last couple of weeks I've had to say, we don't know what it says. So just take it buckshot, you know, you'll apply it to your life as you see fit. But this one in particular, we can know exactly the circumstances that prompted the psalm that he wrote. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel 22. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 21. It's only like a chapter away. 21. We're going to read into chapter 22. I'm going to begin reading chapter 21 in verse 8. So here's our background. David is fleeing Saul, who's pursuing him to kill him. We'll pick up in verse 8. So David comes to a guy named Abimelech. He's a priest of, uh, of I think it's Nob. Here we'll see in a second. And David said to Abimelech, Then have you, not, have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He's telling a lie. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you'll take that, take it. For there is none but that, there, that here. David said, there is none like that. <laughs> Give it to me. Remember, giant, uh, the, the giant Goliath was over nine feet tall. I'm going to guess that even if David was a modest six foot six like myself, the, the sword of a giant might look a little conspicuous in his sheath. <laughs> Verse 10. David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. The king of Gath, the Philistine king of Gath, the hometown of Goliath. With his sword, this is my hand on the top of the sword <laughs> in David's sheath. Verse 13, so he changed, uh, oh, sorry, verse 10. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is not this David the king of the land? 
did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And David took those words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands. And he made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Verse, chapter 22, verse 1. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to meet him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over this happy group of people. <laughs> and there were with him about 400 men. Sanity or insanity? You've got to wonder, why did Achish, the king of Gath, not put David to death? I mean, if we found Osama bin Laden, and he starts dribbling down his beard and clawing and going, ah, like, crazy or not, if you're guilty of the crime against the United States of America, Enough. That wouldn't make any sense. Insane or not. You all on the same page with me? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. There's a lot of things about this passage that make no sense. The only thing that does make sense is Saul. He probably figured that the only place Saul wouldn't come looking for me would be in Philistine territory. Surely he won't pursue me there. He won't even consider that I would go and hide among my enemies to protect myself from Saul. But even in going, he told some lies. He acquired a sword that did not fit the man and walked into the place where he defeated the giant of the hometown with his sword. Well, no wonder they looked at him and said, Ah, oh, here he is. This makes no sense except that God spared David's life. And David knows it. David knows I was within a hair's breadth of losing my life. His only option was to pretend and play mad, let the spittle run down his beard, claw the gates, and act crazy. Get him out of here. So he flees to the cave at Adullam. There are 400 men, likely their wives and children join him. He's surrounded by just the class of society right there. Everyone in debt, everyone in bitterness of spirit. <laughs> and as he sits there reflecting on God's goodness, he pens this psalm. Did he write it in the cave? We can't be certain about that. But it would make sense that it's fresh in his mind as he's sitting there, as maybe a few days have transpired, and he's reflecting on, I should be dead, and I'm not. And I have no good reason to say except for God has spared my life. Have you ever done something really stupid? <laughs> Thank you, Jessica Coleman. Those of, you not watch, those of you watching online, Jessica Coleman is waving her hand. Yes, I've done... <laughs> She and I are the only two in the room that have done anything really, really dumb. Todd, you're lying. I know you've done a lot of dumb things. You should be dead. Come on, I could call out a lot of people this morning. Done a lot of things. You know, when you've done right and God brings trouble into your path, you feel almost justified to call out to him and say, God, have mercy on me. Help me out here. You know I didn't bring this on myself. This isn't my fault. Could you help me out? And we've all seen God rescue us out of those troubles. But when you've done foolishly and you've done things that you probably shouldn't have done, as you think about him like this was really stupid, I can imagine in that prayer, David's like, I can't run. 
I can't hide. I can't fight my way out of this. I got one option. Lord, I pray this works. <laughs> and so he says, I'm going to just pretend like I've lost my mind. And it worked. But he knew it was not because of his great acting. And as you read through Psalm 34, he's like, man, I'm so God, glad that God hears the prayer of those who fear him. I'm so glad that even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. You all be great preachers. You read it exactly, right? Even when we are faithless, yet he remains faithful. And so he calls them to worship in verses 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Who's he surrounded with potentially if he's really writing this in the cave of Adullam? The humble. Those who themselves have done a whole lot of dumb things that have put themselves in the same circumstances. And he wants you to know, I'm just like you. I'm not above you. I make foolish mistakes. I do things that God should kill me. But he doesn't because God hears the prayer. He hears the words. His eyes and his ears are open and attentive to those who fear the Lord. Amen? Amen. So my soul makes us boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Praise God he hears the humble and the, and the lowly. Oh, magnify the Lord to me. Let us exalt his name together. These are the words of a man, again, having seen God intervene in his life in ways that just don't make sense. He begins to explain his own experience beginning in verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Now again, because the psalmist gives us the context of these words, I don't think that we are wrong to go back and look at this. When did he sink the Lord? I'm going to imagine right about that moment that he heard them in the background. Hey, that guy with the weird looking sword that doesn't fit him, that looks a lot like Goliath's sword. Isn't that the guy? David's killed his thousands. Saul's, you know, Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his tens of thousands. About that moment, I'm going to imagine that David prayed a prayer like this. Oh God, I am in a pit of trouble. I can't even close my eyes and bow my head and fold my hands. But Lord, you better do something quick or I'm about to die. I sought the Lord, he says in verse 4, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So now they see him sitting in the cave. He's at peace. He's surrounded by his comrades, those who look, who look to him, are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man, I believe he's right, he's speaking of himself, cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. It dawned on him, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. You know, he starts in verse 4. We might could learn something about giving a good testimony. A good testimony always begins with the words, I sought the Lord. We spend a lot of time telling our story about, oh, there's this thing and it fell apart and it fell apart and this thing was bad. Blah, blah, blah. We, we glorify the problem instead of glorifying God. And he wants to start by glorifying God. I sought the Lord <laughs> and I was in a pickle that you can't even imagine. And the Lord heard my cry. And I wasn't there because I had done good. I was there because I had done bad. But because I am one who characteristically fears God and am on his side, he heard me and delivered me. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. There is a look that accompanies one who has looked to God and is resting and trusting in him, isn't there? It is work to look to him. It takes time in the prayer closet. We've talked about that many times this morning. But to get to the place where you surrender your fears, your agenda, your desires, your plans, and accept the outcomes that God will bring about... Not every one of these moments is where you're literally standing. I'm going to imagine that he's not talking about his face being radiant there before the king is. He's got dribble coming down his beard and he's clawing the gates. He didn't look very radiant right there. But as they looked at him at peace, rested and whole there in the cave, they're like, here's a guy who's at rest. He looks calm.
The angel of the Lord, verse 7, encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Think about this. In the New Testament, probably the angel of the Lord is a recognition of the Lord Jesus Christ. In New Testament times, Jesus would talk to us as New Testament believers that we are held in Christ's hand. And Christ is held in God's hand and nothing and no one is able to pluck us out of his hand. We are safe upon safe upon safe. And David recognized that as he sat there. I went before the king. They should have lopped my head off. But the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. It is cliche, and it's been said a hundred times, but I think it bids saying again, you aren't going anywhere, and nothing is happening to you prematurely that isn't part of God's plan. The angel of the Lord will protect you precisely to the moment that you are to be taken out of here. This does not mean that we should live irresponsibly, that we should jump out of perfectly good airplanes. This does not mean that we should run in front of traffic. But it also means that we ought not operate in fear. David acted presumptuously, acted unwisely. But he recognized that he had divine protection. So our big question that we're looking at this morning is, can those who fear the Lord have lapses in judgment? Well, the answer to that is absolutely we can. David made serious lapses in judgment. And this is the key point of my message, as I've said from the beginning. David's rescue was not from a place of faithfulness and obedience and integrity. His rescue was from God in spite of these things. And God was still watching out for him. Think of the words of that hymn, Years I spend in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. And yet all of those years, he's brought you faithfully and safely to this moment right here, hasn't he? Second Timothy 3, 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he can't deny himself. Even when we don't do what we're supposed to do, that does not suspend the faithfulness of God. He's going to do what he's going to do. He who began a good work in you will perform it, and even your own stupidity can't stand in the way of that. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's great news. Again, we look at his friends who are his companions, everyone who was in distress, In debt, bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And there were about 400 of them. So he calls to them in verse 8. I will instruct you. I'm sorry, that might be helpful if I read the right chapter. (laughs) Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. It's like he's taking a bite of food. He's like, oh, this is good. You try. Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He's trying to make a commercial to this group of vagabonds that have come to hang out with him. If I'm going to be your commander, there's something you need to know about me. I have a protection that you don't have. Can I just pause for a moment? If you are alive and you can hear the sound of my voice, God has been good to you despite his requirement to do so. You are experiencing at this moment the mercy of God. The Bible is very clear. We deserve God's divine wrath and judgment. He should send us all to hell in a minute. If you are alive and you can hear the sound of my voice, you have known the extreme goodness of God. So good is God to us, and so good is God to everyone who's living, everyone who's out doing a million different things this morning. God, in his tremendous mercy, it is not that he is short 
concerning his promises. It is not that he will not hold people accountable. He is just that long-suffering. And a day will come where if you continue to reject this God, he will no longer be kind and gracious and merciful to you. He will deal with you according to justice. His word tells us that he has recorded every evil thought, every evil word, every evil deed. And in that day he has appointed, he will judge every man according to the divine record of your life. You will be found guilty. You will spend eternity in hell, suffering the divine wrath of God. Maybe some of the men who'd gathered themselves along David didn't know God like David knew God. Friend, this morning I must take a moment to say, you need to have a personal relationship with God. You say, what do I need that for? Everything's been going good so far. I've made it this far in life, and I've not been killed. I've seen uh, times where my life has been spared, car accidents where I didn't go off the road, things when I did stupid stuff back when I was in high school that I should have died. You know, I just brought you down a trip on memory lane, didn't I? <laughs> times I shouldn't, and God's kept me alive. That's right. But why has he kept you alive? Why has he shown you his, this goodness? Why has he been long-suffering he has done so to bring you to a point where you would come to see that you have failed his standard. That you would come to see yourself a sinner. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he tells us that because of falling short of God's standard of perfection, the wages of sin is death. You see, you and I have earned death for ourselves. But the good news is that God, in great love for all of humanity, sent his son Jesus Christ to live a sinless life that was different than you and I. And in the end of his life, God the Father allowed Jesus Christ to bear in his body our sin. 1 Peter 2.24 God made Jesus Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God because of our good works? No. We might be made righteous. We might become the righteous of God in him by faith. And so there's a difference. There's those who've rejected Jesus Christ and are under the mercy of God. There's those who have received Jesus Christ and rest under the grace of God. Of God. Now I know his mercy too, but I also know his grace. If you are over on this side and you say, I've never asked Jesus personally to forgive my sin. I've never asked Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and master. If you've never done that, you currently rest under his mercy. If you can hear the sound of my voice, you need to cross over from the mercy camp to the grace camp. David knows this. He's in the Old Testament version of the grace camp. He knows that he has a unique relationship with God, a special relationship with God, known as the fear of the Lord. Almost like a father and son relationship. It's as a child fears their parent. That's not the, uh, like that. Well, maybe it is if the parent's been abusive, but in a, in a proper father-child or parent-child relationship, those children should have a respect and admiration for those parents. That at times is like, I'm a, I, I could just be straight up with you. There's a lot of more junk I would have done in high school, but I knew if I came home, I had to deal with the wrath of Vic Watkins <laughs> that I did not want. It was not even Jesus. It was Vic <laughs> Watkins. I was like, if I do that, Man, I wanted to get an earring. I thought that'd be so cool. My dad told me, he goes, if you put it in, I'll take it out. <laughs> I never got an earring. Wouldn't that have been cute? The earring. <laughs> David had an I fear God relationship. I love him, and I know he loves me, but I want to do what pleases him. 
And if I choose not to do what pleases him, I have reason to be, to be scared. Friend, today, I would tell you, as David is perhaps preaching to his cave-dwelling friends, look, if you're going to be with me and I'm going to be commander over you, you want to cross from this camp over into this camp. Because camp, life in this camp is good upon good upon good. To know that your sin is forgiven. To know that his Holy Spirit comes into you, living you and animating you as you live this life. To know that you're no longer an enemy of God, but you are now a child of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Friends, life in the grace camp is way better than life in the mercy camp. And don't lose me on this. I also receive the mercy of God because I don't always do right. And mercy is treating people better than their sins deserve. Right? So he writes to them in verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Verses 9 and 10. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And so he wants to instruct. And I can only imagine that that come, O oh children, is probably not a reference to the men. Again, they probably came with their families. And so there are children there in the cave. And David wants to pull them around. It's the next generation. He wants to pass the fear of the Lord on to the next generation. And so he asks the question in verse 12 as he begins his teaching on the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that they may see good? Can you imagine him sitting there in front and, you know, 15, 20 little kids in front of him, like a little Sunday school class, and he's sitting on a little rock and there's a little campfire in the middle. He says, who wants to have a good life and see lots of good days? And all the little kids are like, yeah. okay, all right. The parents are in the background listening, soaking this all in. Here's what he says, verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. How to walk in the fear of the Lord. Number one, take heed to your words. Or... Careful what you say. He says again in verse 14. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace. Pursue it. Let's deal with that first one. Take heed to your works. Or, careful what you do. You want to see a long and happy life? Be careful what you say, and be careful what you do. What are you supposed to do there? It says, and we could, let's talk about those two things. First of all, careful what you say. Evil words, slander, cursing, coarse jesting, lies, all of these things, they have no place if you want to live a long and happy life. As God's children, as those who are fearers of God, who recognize that we have an omnipresent God who hears everything, who sees everything, we must be careful with our words. What does it mean to live in the fear of God? There are some things I should not say. Amen? Amen. We need to teach our children this. When we hear gossip, we need to stop it. When we hear slander, we need to stop it. When we hear cursing and coarse jesting, we need to stop it. We need to teach them how to live in the fear of the Lord, that there is a God who hears and sees, and because that kind of speech makes his air toxic with our filth, and we don't want to do that if we're wanting to live in the fear of the Lord. And why would we want to live in the fear of the Lord? Because we want to live a long and happy life. Take heed to your works. Turn away from evil and do good. Stealing, coveting, idolatry, laziness, honoring and obeying authorities, fornication, adultery, sorcery. You can't do those things. Why? Because God says no. Do you want to live a long and happy life? When you see those things, you want to turn and walk away. Many of you have been in my home. We have two barking dogs. Oh, yay. And the little one's worse than the big one. She yaps and yaps and yaps. And I'm trying to greet you, and she's trying to run out the door. I'm like, yeah, if anybody wants a dog. 
you take it up with Maddie, and if you can get her to agree to it, I am on board. <laughs> this dog barks and barks and barks. But there is one magical weapon in our house. It's called the bark collar. It's, for those of you who don't know, it's a red collar. It's got a little box on the front that's got a little couple batteries in it, and it's got these two probes, and it sits right here on their voice box. I don't even have to put it on. I just say, bark collar, and I hold it up, and she's, it's the moment she sees it, she's like, don't. <laughs> I, we literally have to send one person around the table this way and one around this way to catch her and put it on her. But my little girl, Sophie, she makes such a classic example. You want to live in the fear of the Lord. You see evil, and you're walking along, you see evil. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> to walk in the fear of the Lord means there's some things we're not going to do anymore. The characteristic of our life is we don't tell lies. We're going to walk in sexual purity. We're going to be thankful and content with what God has given and not covet what others have. We're not going to take what doesn't belong to us. We're going to speak truth. And whenever anything even remotely on the horizon, mm -mm, we can turn away. That's what it means to walk in the fear of the Lord. Can you see these little kids? And he's sitting on that boulder. He's saying, can you think of times when you do this? Yeah. What are you going to do the next time you see this thing? We're going to turn away, David. We're going to turn away. It's teaching him the fear of the Lord. Thirdly, take heed to peacemaking. Verse 14, he says, Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace. You ever play hide and seek? Hide and seek means somebody's going to go and make it as difficult for you to find them as possible. You're going to count to 100, and then you're going to go find that person who's well hidden. You're going to have to put effort into going to find them. You can't just go, hmm, <laughs> doesn't work. Not a good hide and seek strategy. Seek peace. Why? Because peace is hiding. David knows this. It can be found, but you have to pursue it. We don't like to pursue peace. We'd rather just have our way. Seeking peace involves, first of all, pursuing it, but it means being quick to admit one's faults rather than blame shift or justify your faults. It means learning to yield your ground. Our culture magnifies, exalts the person who stands their ground. Well, I do too in a particular way. But when it comes down to my personal preferences, we need to be quick to defer to others. The scripture says, let each esteem others better than themselves. That means... I want to give preferential treatment to others. Romans 12, outdo, literally says this, outdo one another in showing honor. I just look around my house at times, and it's like we're having a competition to see who can be the best king seated there on the lazy boy. <laughs> Fetch me my water. Fetch me my this. Fetch me my that. The way it ought to be is we're trying to compete to who can be the better servant in the household. Who can be the better servant in the church? If we would start with the mindset as we are servants, bond servants of Jesus Christ, then we would not be angry or upset when called upon to serve. We would also not be Offended when we are treated as a servant, which is often ignored and undervalued. Why does he say to do that? Because it's the way of peace. You see, we can have peace. If we are willing to humble ourselves and pursue the way of peace, we can have it. And so he calls to these young people, you want to live a long and happy life? We've got this goofy little song. In fact, we just did this lesson a couple weeks ago in Family Fusion. I have this Burger King crowd. I said, 
Put your crown on the ground and turn around and look to see what you can do. Roll up your sleeves, put your knees in the breeze. There's work for you to do, it's true. Ba-da, ba-da, ba-da. You'll be less stressed and you'll be if you start to think of yourself less. So take off that crown, put it on the ground, and you will be impressed. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the Lord. That's good theology. That's good music, too. (laughs) But an important lesson there. When we perceive ourselves as kings, then we have kingdom battles. My kingdom against your kingdom against your kingdom against your kingdom against your kingdom. But if Jesus is king and we're all servants, guess what? We can start to get along. Why would you want to walk in the fear of the Lord? I can imagine he's talking to these kids sitting on the rock. Come here, children. You got to be careful what you say. You got to be careful what you do. And you got to pursue peace. You got to chase after it like you're chasing a, you know, something to, to obtain. Like, a, like you're chasing dinner or something. You got to chase it. But why would you want to do that? King David, why would we want to chase? Why would we want the fear of the Lord? I'll answer that. He begins to pick that up in verse 15. Children, here's why you would want to follow the fear of the Lord. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are toward their cry. What an amazing story. I can imagine him sitting there right there on the rock and saying, look, I got to tell you something. Me, Commander David, you, focus right here. Sit down. Stop. Focus. I'll tell you a story. I made a dumb mistake. I went to Gath. I got Goliath's sword. See it here? I went to the king of Gath. I thought it was a good idea. It wasn't a good idea. I cried to the Lord. I had made so many dumb mistakes. I cried to the Lord. He heard my voice. What happened? I escaped with my life. They didn't kill me, and I came to this cave. Can you imagine? Their eyes are big. Because he can talk about this. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. I think about being a parent. All of you parents know this. You can be in a room filled with kids, and all of a sudden you hear a scream, but not any scream. You hear the scream of your child, and you're like, boing! I just blocked everything out, but now that's my kid. God is the same way, isn't he? Again, those in this camp, mercy. He may, he may not. Can't say, can't prove it. Can he hear you? Yeah, he can hear you because he can hear everything. But he doesn't hear the mercy camp like he hears the grace camp. When I cry out to the Lord, I'm a child of God, not because I'm a good person, not because I'm better than anybody else. I'm a child of God because as a seventh grade boy, I submitted my heart to Jesus Christ, and I said, you be the king of my life. You get to call the shots. I will live in the fear of the Lord. He's like, good deal. I'll save you. And when the righteous cry, the Lord hears. You say, but you're not righteous. You're right. I'm righteous by way of the works of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to 1 Peter 2.24. God made him to be sin for me who knew no sin, that I might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So, correction, I am righteous by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ which have been declared to me. Friends, that's the New Testament teaching of justification. I've been declared righteous. And when those who have been declared righteous cry to their righteous heavenly father, he hears. He says over in verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. I can prove that to you. I can literally prove that to you. If you go to the first couple chapters of the book of Genesis, the Bible says that in the days before Noah, the earth was exceedingly awful. God was merciful. God was patient. The Bible even says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. They had 
faithful testimony from God-fearing people. His uh, great-grandfather, I think it would be Enoch, and his son Lamech, and Noah, they would have been faithful men declaring together the truth of God's word to a generation that would not listen. And what happened? That faithful man and his three sons and their four wives all got, they only had one wife apiece. <laughs> Noah, three sons, four wives. Follow me, okay. They got on the boat. God closed the door. And God destroyed all of the works of the wicked. Everything. You don't know one other person from that generation except Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is true today. Hear me, those of you in this camp. I don't care how, what kind of life you lived. I don't care what kind of accomplishments you have achieved. If you don't repent and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, you will be entirely lost and forgotten for forever. You say, Pastor, you're meddling. I'm speaking the truth. I'd stake my life on it. Those in this camp, he writes down our deeds. Those deeds will be remembered forever. I will receive a crown of righteousness. If I have been faithful and I have done anything of lasting value, I will be clothed upon with some kind of manifestation that will follow me for the rest of my eternity. For all eternity. It will be known the kind of man I was. For all of eternity, it will be known the kind of... Again, I'm talking about people in this camp here. For all of eternity... There will be some way that represents to the world what kind of person you were, what kind of Christian you were on for eternity. Everybody in here, complete, utter, total loss. Absolutely nothing over here will matter. Read your Bible. Don't get angry at me. That's what the former generation did. Noah tried to tell people this. Look, you don't understand. I don't care how nice your house is. I don't care how fast your horses are. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. If you don't get on this boat, you're going to die. You idiot. Who get on that boat? <laughs> you look as ridiculous you look. The last thing I've been doing in the world is get on that boat, you moron. What's wrong with you? <laughs> get on the boat. They're all gone. There will be no rejoicing over any of the millions of people. There will be no recounting of their good works. There will be no recounting of their bad works. They'll be utterly and totally forgotten, and the same thing will happen to today's generation. If you don't trust Jesus Christ, and you aren't in Christ, like they needed to be in the boat, you've got to be in Christ. If you aren't in Christ, you will likewise perish you got to be in Christ. So he gives those who fear have God's attention, verse 15. Those who fear have God's deliverance, verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. I've got some references. I'll just give them to you for sake of time. 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. You need to understand... God does not keep us out of troubles. He delivers us out of troubles. There's a difference. We wish that it were the first. Somebody say amen. amen. I wish I never went into trouble. But that's not what the Bible says. He delivers you out of all those troubles. He saves us out of those troubles. Second Corinthians eleven sixteen, 16, Paul said many times, you know, I was imprisoned, I was beaten, I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I spent in the deep, all this stuff. You say, wow, it's such a blessing that the 
all-powerful, loving God of the universe is the Lord of your life. He's done a marvelous job caring for you. That wasn't Paul's point. Many are the troubles of the righteous. Isn't that what he how ends this psalm? Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Oh, man, I wish I had more time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cruise along through these he talks again in verse 3, or, or, verse 18. Those who fear have God's presence. So the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. He does not prevent the broken heart, but he is near to the brokenhearted. He does not prevent the crushed spirit, but he saves those who are of a crushed spirit. Any believer who's in this room who's been saved for more than 10 years has the testimony of a broken and crushed spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. You have been there. You might be there right now, but you're surrounded by a company of people that I can tell for the most part, we aren't there now. Amen. Amen. I will be there again. My heavenly father whom I love will appoint more suffering. It may even be this week. But unless he kills me, he will save me out of it. Oh, man. If we were to give testimony this morning, we could literally be here the remainder of the day. If you stepped to the microphone and you said, God brought this hardship into my life. But I sought the Lord and he heard my cry and delivered me from all my fears. Hand the microphone to the next one. Yeah. I hear you, brother. I hear you, sister. I thought I was in a pile of trouble. I thought there's no way out of this. And it was bad. It was really bad for a while. But I'm out of it. I promise you leave here a blessed person. I wish we had about 30 minutes more. But the nursery workers and the children's church workers will kill me. <laughs> Those who fear have God's redemption. Um, boy, oh boy, I feel like I've skipped something here. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to read because this is good stuff. As David reflects on the spiritual high that he's currently experiencing, he's not aloof to the realities of walking in the fear of God. Children need to be taught the realities of the afflictions that attend God-fearing people. Teach your kids. God's goodness is not in conflict with affliction. Amen. Danny, did you hear me? All right. <laughs> Call out more names. You're like, oh, man, please. Don't like, oh. <laughs> I know your names. <laughs> God's goodness is not in conflict with affliction. Children need to be taught that. Many are the afflictions, verse 19 says, of the righteous, the Lord delivers out of them all. Plumer said this in his excellent commentary on Psalms. The Christian religion is the only form of doctrine on earth that candidly admits the full extent of human woe and at the same time makes adequate provision for the support of the pious sufferer and for his full and final deliverance from all that can harass the mind. We're the only ones who teach, yes, you fall into pits, but yes, he delivers them out of them. And one day you'll fall into that pit. He'll say, I'm not intending to bring you out of this one. I'm bringing you home. So even in death, he is a deliverer. Amen. Uh, I'm editing on the fly here. Don't kill me, Sharon. I love this from Spurgeon, verse 21. Look at that with me. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Affliction, Spurgeon said this, there, this is speaking of people in this camp, their adversities will be killing them. They are not medicine, but poison. Right. He's delivering me, and I'm learning more about God's plan and how his love and suffering in my life are friends, not enemies. I'm learning more about the character of God and the goodness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. I'm learning these things. 
And as he brings me into the pit, I'm learning to trust him more. So I don't get quite as frazzled and freaked out as I used to. Now stuff happens. I've told you my story in the airport with my dad. We were in Ireland. It's all falling apart. Oh, going on my thought. I'm like, oh, come on, I thought of you. What? I'm on the phone trying to figure this thing out, right? He didn't start there. He's ever progressing there. Trials don't rattle him. They're shaping us. On this other side, embitterment, hostility. How could a good God allow such fill in the blank? You're listening to me online or you're here this morning. You say, wow, you just nailed me. I hope I did. How could a good God allow blank? Friend, you need to step over into this side where you begin to see your suffering and your trials through the lens of God's goodness, through his grace, recognizing what I deserve is hell, death, and judgment, and I have life, forgiveness, and everlasting life. And a God far wiser than I knows that my heart is sinful and that I need the exercise of suffering to bring out righteousness in my life instead of bitterness in my life. You say, you that's double talk. No, when you hop from the mercy side into the righteousness side, he sends his Holy Spirit into you that causes me and us to process life biblically where we look at it differently. He'll do the same for all who call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. John 13, 17 through 18 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I can't make it any clearer. If you are over here, you have to move from this pot into this pot. And Jesus Christ and the cross and the work that he did there is the only way to get from the mercy pot into the grace pot. you got to trust in him. You stand under his condemnation. I know it may not feel like it because you're alive and you're going to get up and you're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to go to your sports games and you're going to eat nice food and you're going to live in a nice house and you're going to do all this kind of stuff. That is an expression of God's goodness. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. He does not change in his goodness. He is good, but he's also just. And that's your biggest problem. God's goodness isn't your problem. God's justice is your problem. And you need to understand, if you don't turn from your sin and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, his condemnation, as it says right there, John 3, 17 and 18, his condemnation rests on you. You absolutely will be lost and judged forever in a Christless eternity. Beyond all doubt, not my opinion, that's what the book says. It's what it says. One last thing. I got to just say this. Verse 19. I'm sorry, verse 20. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. That was actually quoted at the cross the the apostles who wrote about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ quoted this verse out of this passage. Some commentators have woven the, the cross narrative all through the psalm. I don't think that's fair to do, especially when the opening thing says that this happened after David made those foolish mistakes at the, you know, with King, with the Philistine King. But here's what I will say. The The writers of the New Testament who recorded and pulled that verse and said, this applies to Jesus Christ. Not one of his bones are broken. Jesus Christ, God the Father, in abundant love for Jesus Christ, allowed Jesus to be 